fortunate tonight to have the Pulitzer Prize winning critic, architectural critic, Paul Cap. He studied at the University of Ohio and graduated in 1950. He served on the uh, Cleveland uh, Plain Dealer newspaper. He worked for the Chicago Sun Times. After about 10 years with the Sun Times, he became the uh, executive director of the Chicago Council of the American Institute of Architects. After that time, for the past 15 years, he has been the full time architectural critic for the Chicago Tribune. You can always find his, uh, his critical reviews in the Sunday uh, Tribune and often uh, during the week. I was, uh, I was a Sunday paper when I read it. I'm very happy to, to see his reviews. I especially enjoyed a couple weeks ago when he talked about a building that I particularly dislike, the new Bloomingdale building. He referred to it as uh, one that almost everyone would agree of the latest uh, monsters in Chicago, that it was probably the most unbeautiful. So uh, we're very happy to have you with us tonight, uh, Paul Gap. Thank you and good evening. You could really chill beer in here, couldn't you? Can everyone hear me? I'm wired up two ways here, one for the man with the camera. I'm certainly pleased to be making my first visit to Ball State and to the city of Muncie. Perhaps you won't be surprised to learn that the uh, first time I ever heard of Muncie, it was when one of my college sociology professors back in Ohio made me read the old Middletown book by Robert and Helen Lynn. As I recall, Dr. Lynn later said that he never called Muncie the typical American city. And then much later, around 1980, I became curious and looked it up. Another study of Muncie was performed and it showed that the city had established really hadn't changed a lot since the first Middletown books were written 50 years earlier. Well, I don't know, but uh, my first impression is that the Muncie of 1988 is probably a pretty nice place to live, and also that it seems to be fairly non-radical territory. Nevertheless, I would hope that Ball State, and particularly the College of Architecture and Planning are not too passive, not too supine about the way they receive their visiting lecturers. All such lecturers should be listened to with a certain amount of skepticism. And if you're a student, you ought not to be over impressed by anyone's credentials. I think you should be particularly careful about failing to challenge the belief system of a visiting architect just because his work happens to be currently fashionable. Not to mention being wary of newspaper critics who think they know it all. Another complication is that architecture produces an enormous amount of gobbledygook and opaque prose in written and spoken form. We've all been exposed to that. And whenever I point this out, I'm fond of quoting a few wise and witty words by Osbert Lancaster, the British author, cartoonist, and stage designer. Mr. Lancaster once had this to say, and I quote, around none of the art with the possible exception of dry fly fishing and 12-tone music, has so formidable a mystique been woven as that which defogs architecture. From Ruskin onward, architectural writers have not hesitated to cover a variety of moral and sociological themes 
for which the pretext was neither immediately nor subsequently obvious. These writers have also isolated architecture from the rest of human experience and thus rendered it for the ordinary reader as remote and incomprehensible as the quantum theory. End of quotation. Another sharp analyst of architectural writing was the late Arthur Drexler, long the director of architecture at New York's Museum of Modern Art. Mr. Drexler once made this observation, and again I quote, there are two classes of architecture critics. One is the media journalist working for a newspaper or magazine or television, and the other is the academic who is writing for other academics in journals of narrow circulation. The required style for academics is inarticulateness, passing as great verbal felicity and an even greater philosophical depth. But you discover that behind the style, there is very little content. The other kind of criticism in the mass media is oversimplified, almost of necessity, this is Phil Drexler talking, because if you are expected to produce eight inches of copy three times a week, you tend to standardize its production. We have one or two journalists who write the same article five times. They also write the same article five times within the same article. <laughs> End of quotation by Arthur Drexler. God bless him. He was a cantankerous old guy, but he was great. Of course, the thing we hear over and over again is that this is a time of great change in architecture, which is obviously true. And a time of great tumult and polemicism in architecture, which is also true, although the tumult of the early 1980s is beginning to die down a bit. The truth is that we're getting a substantial amount of solid and handsome and functional architecture in America these days. We're getting a lot of mediocre architecture too, of course, but I don't think the balance between the two has really changed much in the last few decades. Because so many architectural ideas and styles are being recycled these days, it's necessary, even for those of us who are, are close to architecture, to step back occasionally to get a decent uh, chronological context for observing this whole flow of uh, contemporary events. And while I do intend to talk a fair bit about technology here tonight, I think a little historical overview will also help give a, a kind of a tight a little context for thinking about that. It makes sense, I think, to begin very briefly, simply recalling the period between about 1876 and 1917, the years of the great American Renaissance. When we examine this Renaissance, we see a grand attempt to unify many of the arts including architecture, painting, sculpture, the decorative arts, and landscaping. This unification was intended to enrich the built environment with works of beauty that would inspire the entire population. American Renaissance buildings were clearly comprehensible to the public in the sense that they were not so abstract or cerebral that one could react to them only with the help of a tutor. I think that the beauty of these often classically rooted buildings truly enriched human experience. It was during this same period, around the turn of the century, that the Chicago, the so-called Chicago School of Architecture was flourishing. Of course, it was in the school in the academic sense, I mean, this is, this, this is largely an architectural audience you have, have here this evening, I see, I assume. Uh, but rather, a, uh, the Chicago style, a muscular 
style that visually expressed the bones of the building, the skeleton, the skeletal frame, and so on. And the fact that some of these buildings were heavily ornamented did not necessarily dilute their expression of structure. It was more or less with the development of the skeletal metal frame that 20th century technology began having a profound effect on architecture. In any case, it was after World War I that America truly entered the age of the super-tall skyscraper and its new form. One of the things that developed along with the skyscraper during that same rather narrow but glorious period was the style we call Art Deco and, and uh, closely alongside of it, Art Modern. And certainly the, pra the practitioners of those styles gave the nation some of the most effervescent architecture it had ever seen. So, much of the architecture of the 1920s and 1930s was unabashedly theatrical. It was a commercial architecture that encouraged corporate exhibitionism. It was above all, however, a populist architecture. Well, we're racing through history here, and let's make our next big jump to the years immediately following World War II. It was at that time that America began to embrace the international style that was nurtured in the Bauhaus and brought to the United States by the likes of Walter Gropius and Nick Sandero. Now, what sometimes gets missed in the telling of this part of the tale is the fact that the international style's advocates happen to be in the right place at the right time for some very special reasons. And again, we run into manifestations of new technology. The United States had built up an immense aluminum production capacity during the war, and the companies that made that aluminum were looking for new markets one of which, of course, turned out to be curtain walls for skyscrapers. Most of the new heating, ventilating, and air conditioning equipment had been refined so that people wouldn't choke to death in sealed high-rises. Fluorescent lights made daylight unnecessary in workspaces, or so management said. Office tenants wanted huge expanses of floor space because of the changing nature of business demand the way things were organized. And these purely programmatic aspects fit the international style perfectly, or perhaps the other way around, if you prefer. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the practitioners of the international style were not uniformly skillful. So we had me turning out things like the Seagram building in New York and 868-80 in Chicago. But during this same period, the nation also had hundreds of less inspired architects churning out uh, low-budget international-style boxes that began having an appallingly dreary effect on skylines all over the United States. The legacy of that remains with us, of course. So we're stuck with hundreds of millions of square feet of drab, containerized space in which we live and work and study and shop and so on. Well, we know that the rebellion against this kind of dreariness began in 1966 when Philadelphia architect Robert Venturi wrote his famous book called Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. Venturi found his inspiration in places like Las Vegas. He advocated a kind of lively pop architecture that was partly rooted in his in historicism, and that restored the legitimacy of ornament. It was okay to decorate buildings again, and everything did not have to be matte black. Very simply, Venturi was the father of postmodern uh, post architecture. He was our great architectural revolutionary of the late 1960s, although it took quite a while for this radical movement to acquire momentum. Like so many other things in the United States, 
Postmodern architecture became legitimatized when big business began spending big money on it. More specifically, it got its intellectual as well as its commercial imprimatur in 1978 when Philip Johnson designed the corporate AT&T building in New York City. The postmodern rebellion against the international style encountered great resistance, of course, and nowhere in America was the resistance greater than in Chicago. A thing which, oddly enough, you don't hear many Chicago architects talk about, this, this lagging behind, this being kicked and dragged into the new era. But after all, it was to Chicago that Mies had come when he fled Germany. It was where he lived and practiced and taught architecture for the last 30 years of his life. It was the city where his buildings were to be found in by far the greatest concentration. And so most of Chicago's most prominent homegrown architects resisted postmodernism rather ferociously, viewing it as a kind of transient aberration. But of course they were wrong, and by 1980 the impact of postmodernism was reverberating up and down the streets of Chicago, just as it was everywhere else. Well, architecture is a business as well as an art and a science. I assume they teach you that here. It is a business. It's not a break-even proposition. At least most architects hope it won't be a break-even proposition. And in order to compete, even such conservative firms as Skidmore's and Merrill found they had to start breaking down the old box and paying homage to the new fashion in architecture. Nonetheless, the international style, or modernism, if you prefer, is not dead, despite the polemical beating it took at the hands of the revolutionaries. It's still practiced today, even though it's lost its dominance. And it's tremendously influential still as a, a, as a, a discipline departure point or conceptualization among those who no longer follow it as absolute dogma. Postmodernism has lost much of its old polemical bite which really isn't necessary anymore. The revolution has been won after all, and the postmodernists have changed the course of architecture. So we see some of them pulling back a bit. Michael Graves still enjoys putting statues on the tops of his buildings and fiddling with obscure little metaphors and making architectural in-jokes and so on. We still have a few designers who simply enjoy being outrageous, such as Philip Johnson, who caused a lot of commotion this summer when he threw together his deconstructivist show in New York. I don't know if any of you saw that. It was a mess. On the other hand, other postmodernists have begun mellowing a little. And now that the need to shock is behind them, Architects like Robert Venturi can concentrate on refinement of their ideas for clients who don't particularly want to shock anybody. As a result, I think architects like Venturi, not to single him out alone, are making much better architecture than they were 15 years ago. At the same time, the most conservative centrists in architecture are moving to the left, if I may put it that way. They are not only acknowledging the past, but finding inspiration in it and borrowing from it. So what we are slowly beginning to see in America is a narrowing of the gap between the architecture of the 1960s and architecture of the 1980s. We are seeing a tempering of the old extremism, a coming together of the left and the right, a kind of synthesis. We are witnessing a new eclecticism emerging out of the old pluralism in which competing styles were readily identifiable. Some say we're, we're rapidly moving towards 
some consolidation of postmodernism into a, a classical vein. The classicism is, is the new architecture. If you will, one could can make an argument for that, although I think it's a bit early to be too firm on that on that uh, speculation. But it is getting harder and harder to hang a label on things. Our new eclecticism makes life more difficult for people who write and lecture about architecture. It will perhaps make life miserable for art historians of the future who seek facile connections between things. And yet this slowly emerging eclecticism is beginning to give us some rather good architecture. And in any case, we mustn't strangle on semantics. We must remember that the basic standards for judging architecture have, in a sense, not changed since the time of Vitruvius. We define architecture's three most important qualities as commodity, firmness, and delight. And that really hasn't changed. So, here we are in 1988, moving into this new eclecticism that just may be with us for a long, long time. But, is that all there is to it? Well, no, because we still have to deal with the architectural maverick. We have to recognize people like Bertrand Goldberg, who never cared about what was fashionable, and who marched to the sound of nobody else's drum. We have mavericks like Frank Gehry, the Los Angeles architect who takes cubism and constructivism and smashes them together into buildings made out of chain ring fence and sheet metal and so on. Some very beautiful buildings. Although it's important to recall that, that some of Gehry's best buildings have been quite straight, so to speak, and strongly rooted in modernism. And of course, in addition to the maverick, to the foreign invaders coming in, led by such Japanese as Arata Isazaki, the Tokyo wild man, and Kenzo Tangi, the dean of, dean of Japanese architecture. Incidentally, Tangi has just unveiled his first American skyscraper, which is to be built in Chicago, and the commission for still another Chicago building has just gone to Kisho Kurokawa, another major Japanese design figure. We've only seen a couple of renderings of the Tangi building, by the way, and all I can say is it's no barn burner. You say that down here, it's no barn burner? I guess you do. We do. Well, that's the, that's, that's the little ultra-condensed overview of what's been happening for the last hundred years or so. Much of the same history applies to architecture in the rest of the world as well. And it's wise to keep this historic context in focus at all times as one tries to make sense out of contemporary architecture, or to develop one's own value system for the practice of architecture. Still, you better not lose your grip on the nuts and bolts of architecture, because that's really what the enclosure of space is all about, is it not? It won't do if the roof leaks and all the doors stick and the city building department says you blew it up meeting the fire code. So we come back to a consideration of technology and architecture and what that has meant for better and for worse in the 20th century, because you can't really separate the science from the art of architecture. I heard Philip Johnson lecture a group of architecture students a couple of years ago, and he told them, it doesn't make any difference if you learn where to put the tower. Someone else will take care of that. Well, of course, that's, that's bunk, unless you're Philip Johnson, who never even had learned how to draw. Took the test six times before he passed the state exam. In any case, I, I, don't, I don't think it, it, it makes much sense to sit around and make polemical uh, blanket arguments against modern technology uh, any more than it makes sense to say that nuclear power is inherently and ultimately evil. And of course it was around 
long before man existed. Mankind. Human, humankind. You see, I'll get it right. Yes. Yet we have underused, overused, and misused technology and architecture. Sometimes we let it lead us around by the nose. And much of the misuse of technology springs from our obsession with tallness and high density, which is another way of saying profit, usually. For example, we might say that one of the greatest forms of social distress in recent decades appears to be caused by high-rise public housing. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Yet, technologically speaking, this is the only new housing form of the 20th century. It is an architectural invention that in some cities has become a social nightmare. The pruitt Igo solution, demolition, appears to be the only solution that makes any sense in most instances. Yet, America is stuck with tens of thousands of units of this aging high-rise housing, because back in the 50s, very few had the foresight to realize that it would wipe out most of the strength of the, tra the traditionally organized low-rise neighborhood. There were a few voices, such as Jane Jacobs and so on, but no one really paid much attention. Of course, the, uh, the American passion for tallness manifests itself still more strongly in commercial buildings. And this is worth special attention in any examination of technology. When William LeBaron and Jenny invented the metal frame skyscraper in Chicago in the late 19th century, it was a very benign creation. The height limit on bearing wall buildings had been reached. Well, why not build taller structures supported by their frames? instead of their walls, why not build 20 stories tall, or even 30 or 40 stories tall? And other technological advances followed that ultimately made possible the curtain wall building as we know it today. Elevators, obviously, fire protection, high-rise water pumping systems, and so on, were all devised. But we take so many of these things for granted, and we tend to, to sort of pull them out of architectural history of the last century so and set them aside as though they were entirely separate from the aesthetic aspects of architecture and of course they're totally interwoven of a piece. They can't they can't be separated. And we take so many of these these inventions and systems for granted. One of them that always amuses me is the revolving door, for example. It amuses me because it's so arcane. I like arcane things. Uh, Consider the revolving door and how it came to be invented. Well, first there had to be a problem, and it was a very serious one before the door was invented. I mean, we had heated air sucking cooler air into doorways and sending it screaming up through elevator shafts and tall buildings in what engineers call the stack effect. And then along came a man named Theophilus Van Cannell. Uh, how good are you at architectural trivia? <laughs> this ought to be in everybody's final or something. Well, it was Theophilus Van Cannell who, in 1889, invented the revolving door, which prevented the stack effect in an ingeniously simple way. The Franklin Institute even gave Van Cannell a gold medal for that achievement, although one rarely hears the fellow's name mentioned today. Well, as technology permitted still taller and bulkier buildings, the problems they created began impacting on their surroundings as well. This meant there were new public environmental problems to be solved. When the Equitable Building was constructed in New York City in 1915, it covered a full square block and became the world's largest office building at 1.2 million square feet. 1915. The equitable density created a furor, became politicized, and so on. And that controversy ultimately led to the adoption of New York's 1916 building code, 
which was the great granddaddy of all attempts to regulate skyscraper construction. However, since those earliest days of New York's zoning restrictions on height, America's cities have really achieved rather little in the orderly regulation of skyscraper growth. In New York itself, zoning wasn't tough enough to prevent acute overbuilding of the central and east sides of midtown Manhattan. The city recently, rather recently, adopted some measures to encourage new construction further west. And of course, now west side density threatens to get out of control in Manhattan. Occasionally, New York does get tough on single tall buildings which pose particular threats, and uh, such as when it recently uh, vetoed the Sasi skyscraper that would have thrown a long shadow on the southwest corner of Central Park. In Chicago, a succession of city administrations has followed a laissez faire policy on tall buildings and high density in order to attract developers and broaden the city's tax base. Zoning is liberal to begin with, and variations are easy to get. In common with other cities, many other cities, Chicago does have something called a planned unit development ordinance. This is a device whereby zoning limits are in effect set aside on a given project. The owner, the architect, and city planners sit down and bargain. Theoretically, the owner offers extra amenities in exchange for height bonuses, figure FAR. The trouble is, the city and the general public usually get the short end of the bargain, to put it mildly. San Francisco, and you're having a speaker here from, he was either just here or he's on the way, uh, used to work in Chicago. San Francisco has what is probably the toughest big city zoning ordinance in the nation so far as high-rise construction in the central area is concerned from a set of stand uh, standpoint. It is intended to prevent further degradation of the city's natural topography by poorly located and insensitively designed skyscrapers. It goes so far as to encourage such specific design elements as tapering tops, finials, and so on. Finally, we come to cities such as Houston, which doesn't believe in having any zoning restrictions at all. Zoning restrictions as we know them, zoning ordinance. And that doesn't work out as badly as one might imagine, however else you may feel about Houston. Well, the skyscraper height competition that began back in the 1920s in New York has, of course, since spread to Chicago and other cities in America and abroad. Structural engineers employing the latest uh, uh, framing systems speak glibly of towers that rise 150, 200 stories or even taller. At the present time, there are nine buildings in the world, measuring more than 1,000 feet in height, 11 measuring more than 900 feet, and many dozens and dozens of others that rise well over 600 feet. Certainly there are a lot of developers and architects with large egos who would like to break that is the existing height record. There is, however, an economic point of diminishing returns at work in the height competition. This is why Sears Tower still holds a height record of uh, 1,454 feet. Many people seem to feel that if the present record is broken, it will probably happen in some place like Hong Kong or Singapore, not in the United States. Probably a good guess. Meanwhile, there has been something of a breakthrough in the development of ultra-strong concrete as a framing material either alone or in combination with steel. And as architects design postmodern towers with complicated tops, structural engineers and contractors have been required to come up with sophisticated techniques to meet these new construction challenges. 
some of the problems of moving trains around and so forth are almost unthinkable. Uh, they're absolutely mind-boggling. How do you put the top on? Still other basic technological advances in the design of tall towers have been achieved in recent years to cope with earth earthquakes. Research teams, particularly from Japan and the United States, immediately proceed to the scene of virtually every damaging earthquake where major buildings are involved. The data they've gathered have helped them develop building uh, configurations, foundation systems, ways of clinging uh, mechanical entrails of the building and so forth, and other seismic related ways of handling things. Meanwhile, however, tall towers continue to be built on the west coast in what would seem to be an invitation to an eventual disaster of an unthinkable scope. The long-term deterioration of cladding materials has also been plaguing architects, and engineers, and high-rise building owners in the last few years. Some of these situations are highly publicized and get into ENR and uh, the journals and so on, and others of them don't. There's a lot of it around, and one of the worst problems, as I'm sure you all know, has occurred at the Amico building in Chicago where the marble skin has become brittle and bowed, and where it may be necessary to reclad the whole building with a different material, probably aluminum. And no matter what the solution, the cost will be enormous. The cost has already been enormous, millions. Glass has been a problem in other tall buildings, including Sears Tower. And who can forget the catastrophic problems caused by windows in Boston's Hancock building back when it was under construction. The science of designing and constructing buildings using appropriate materials and procedures is still obviously far from perfection. And of course, no matter what happens, the architect is always one of the defendants in any lawsuit. The technology of architecture took some especially hard rap in the early 1970s when the energy crisis hit us, thanks to OPEC and so on. It suddenly became clear at that time that we were wasting tremendous amounts of energy in this country and that a lot of the energy was being wasted in modern high-rise buildings. We tend to forget some of the ways in which that waste manifested itself and the manner in which the waste was encouraged. This was not so very long ago, after all. For example, in the 1960s, some electrical utility companies offered bargain rates to buildings that agreed to be all electric. If you used electricity for heating as well as cooling, you got a still lower rate. One of the gimmicks in office buildings was the so-called heating with light. The heat radiated from extra high intensity fluorescent lighting tubes helped keep buildings warm in the wintertime in a terribly inefficient way, of course. In the summertime, the heat from these blindingly bright lighting fixtures, I forget the number of foot candles they cast on a person's desk, but I mean it was strictly brain surgery city. The, in the summertime, this heat has to, had, had to be drawn off and exhausted so it wouldn't overload the cooling system. I don't think you could call that either high-tech or low-tech. It was really more of a Rube Goldberg system that just didn't make any sense. Well, it made even less sense when some of the same electric utility companies pulled one of their smarmier tricks. After selling a lot of people on the idea of all electric buildings, the utility suddenly jacked up the electricity rate to where they had been before. And there wasn't anything their captive all electric customers could do about it. If you if you build a 40-story high-rise apartment building with room by room uh, air conditioner heaters, there wasn't any way to go because there was no because there were any ducts. So those people took it on the chip in the pocketbook. And we were wasting huge amounts of power 
when the oil price crisis came down on us back in the early 70s, 73. We're wasting electricity, wasting gasoline, and so on. And it's, it's, it's worth recalling what happened when that realization began sinking in. One of the first things that happened was that everybody turned off nighttime floodlighting on the exteriors of public and private buildings because it was perceived as an unpatriotic waste. We did it at the Tribune. Turn off those lights up there, we'll save a gallon. Next, architects and engineers began figuring out ways of saving power in existing buildings and in the design of new ones. Now, a certain amount of cheating went on, as you might expect. For instance, our building codes specify how much fresh air must be taken into a building and how much stale air must, must be exhausted for the comfort and health of its occupants. Well, when the price of power shot up, the owners of existing buildings fine-tuned their HVAC system so they wouldn't have to take in as much fresh air in the wintertime as required by law. That cold air had to be heated after all, and it cost a lot of money to heat. The same thing applied to cooling the fresh hot air from outside in the summertime. So they broke the law and they saved money, and a lot of them still do. And that aggravates indoor air pollution, a subject to which I shall return shortly. Well, the energy crisis of the 1970s did encourage the owners of some large buildings to spend millions of dollars on mechanical retrofits that did save a lot of power and, of course, a lot of money. Finally, the energy shortage encouraged the development of new design performance standards, some which we still adhere to today. Studies by such groups as the AIA determined that energy savings of up to 40% could be achieved by design changes. And few of these changes were very radical. You can accomplish a lot with natural ventilation sources, external sunshade, skylights for daytime illumination, and so on. You can save a lot by making it possible to selectively shut down electrical systems systems at the discretion of building users. If one person comes into his office to work on the weekend, he doesn't have to turn on all the lights on the floor, a practice which is so imperative in thousands of office buildings that have never been retrofitted. Well, for a time back in the 70s, it looked like the federal government might also, in effect, impose a tough new set of energy saving standards on the entire nation. We were moving pretty close to that for a while. But it never came to pass because it was too politically volatile. There was a lot of powerful lobbying against that. Uh, National Association of Home Builders, as I recall, was one of the most uh, powerful lobbyists uh, against that, that uh, uh, proposed set of national energy standards. Now, you must understand that, that at the time all this glittering was going on, maybe pe many people were, I say this to some of the slightly younger members of the audience, many people were convinced that we were really on the brink of disaster. You could hear predictions that all the world's known oil reserves would run out in 30 or 40 years. That sort of thing. It was hard to know what to believe. Today, we know that many of these doomsayers were way off the mark, but that we do still face very serious problems. The good old days of dirt cheap power are over, and they'll never return unless we come up with power generated by nuclear fusion or some such technological breakthrough. And even then, there would be no guarantee that the utilities wouldn't find a way to inflate their prices. And these are all architectural considerations. They're all of the business of architecture, I should say. Meanwhile, the economic realities of real estate development and the capabilities of architects and engineers 
continue up to the present to account for savings in energy. We aren't panicky the way we were 10 or 15 years ago, but we aren't squandering power in quite the way we used to. Certainly not in heating this room this evening. <laughs> the main incentive, of course, is economic. I think, too, that a, a new conservation ethic has been embraced by many architects. And I believe that it transcends even uh, pragmatic financial considerations. Architects don't seem to be afraid to talk about this anymore. Uh, it used to be kind of, I don't know, a sissy thing or something to be, uh, you know, to observe a conservation ethic. Now it's the thing to do. It's it. And some of the buildings that are <coughs> being designed obviously directly reflect such concerns. Not just the ones that are built in Minnesota in the middle of the Gobi Desert either, but in more benign climate. I mentioned indoor air pollution a moment ago, and that's a subject that's certainly worthy of architectural attention. Because it's part of the price we pay for the way we design and equip and maintain our buildings, particularly our sealed office buildings. Now, we all know about the hazards of asbestos and the high cost of remedying that problem, but there are many other ingredients in the so-called sick office syndrome. Formaldehyde is present in paneling, carpeting, partitions, and furniture, things of that sort. Bacteria and fungi flourish in air circulation systems that are difficult to maintain, all of which are specked out by, ar by architectural firms. Carbon monoxide sometimes seeps into offices through ductwork from garages and loading docks. Man-made chemicals emit vapors and gases from copying machines and other devices commonly used in offices. And of course, there's tobacco smoke. And this sort of common contamination has been linked to lung damage, headache, sore throat, fatigue, nausea, this sounds like a TV commercial, allergies, asthma, and infectious diseases of all sorts, among other things, all of which result in, ab in absenteeism and decreased efficiency. The widespread use of computer display terminals in offices is also creating a whole new array of problems that we're just beginning to understand. But we know there are serious eye strain and even radiation problems caused by computer terminals. It's beginning to show up on medical compensation claims made against employers. And many of these claims are standing up in court. This is no small thing, even though it's the biggest of it is still down the pike a bit. And architects cannot simply turn their backs on these problems, particularly since they sometimes inno innocently exacerbate them in very obvious ways. For instance, it makes absolutely no sense to specify overhead fluorescent ceiling lights in offices where most of the workers spend all day staring at computer screens because the glare problem created by ceiling lights can be absolutely intolerable. In any case, technological problems more often than not cause call for technological solutions, and I think it's up to architects to collaborate with other specialists in finding these solutions, rather than just passively accepting them and being forced into specking things out in the same old way. And I can hardly mention the use of computers in any sort of context without uh, mentioning computer-assisted design, which represents a huge technological leap forward. At least I, I think it's forward. I have seen what the most sophisticated computer system can do in a large architectural office. It's really awesome. It's also wonderful for scut work, like drawing repeated elements, to mention just one example. A marvelous new tool. Yet, I wonder about the future. 
I read about new computers where you feed the programmatic requirements and the budget into one end, and the building comes out of the other end, so to speak. And that kind of scares me, because we already live in a nation full of butler buildings and prefabs and cookie-cutter work, where the hand of the architect is scarcely visible. So how much further can this go on before the traditional role of the architect practically withers away? There are other chilling technological possibilities. The eminent historian Dr. Daniel Borston recently suggested that the architecture of the future should include disposable buildings. He said these throwaways would acknowledge changing functions and aesthetics. I've always had great respect for Dr. Borson. He's written some extraordinary books, marvelous books. But I think he's really gone off the tracks this time. Because for one thing, he's overlooking the fact that we're already building throwaways at the same time we're tearing down some of our greatest landmarks. It seems to me that we sometimes evoke too much of our technological prowess to creating buildings that satisfy architects and owners while giving short trips to building use. But let's uh, cut that even a little finer and, and define what we mean by building use. One building type that comes to mind in this respect is hospital. Hospital. I, like many others in this room, I've spent a fair amount of time in hospitals over the years as an inpatient and outpatient and mostly as a healthy architectural observer who is capable of making reasonably detached and unemotional judgments. Not very hard to do when you're not sick. The most important people in hospitals are the patients. This, this is my impression. The people who pay the bills and sometimes get well. Yet hospitals, by and large, are not deserved to serve, not designed, I'm sorry, are not designed to serve patients and their personal needs with any degree of sensitivity. Hospitals are designed to serve administrators, doctors, nurses, technicians, and cleaning ladies. In some respects, they function no better than the lunatic asylum of the 17th century. If you don't believe me, spend a couple of days loitering around the hospital and you'll see what I mean. Occasionally, hospitals pass through what I would call periods of temporary technological fashion. Some years back, for example, I've discussed this with doctors who are just appalled at the way these bills of goods get sold. Some years back, uh, interstitial spaces between floors were all the rage for a while on grounds that they increased flexibility in the use of equipment. But for some reason, that's no longer in, in vogue. The old interstitial space thing is just kind of gone in your orthodox general hospital. In any event, the architect frequently does not have enough input from the prime user of these buildings he designs. Whether the buildings are hospitals or schools or hotels or offices or what have you, residences. It is true, however, that we have to a small degree improved our information gathering procedures to better serve these new building types. For instance, I'm, I'm hardened about in some of the research that's been done in housing for the elderly. You probably are aware, and excuse me if some of it may have even been done here, uh, a considerable research has been done uh, in, in, in uh, uh, very, very innovative kind of design of research approaches to the design of housing for the elderly, places like the University of Michigan and elsewhere. The young people doing the research go around all day wearing ingenious devices that downgrade their vision and their hearing and their other faculties. And they find out what it really feels like to be old before they set out to draft design standards that will really serve the elderly. They deal with specifics not just uh, conventional wisdom and intuition. 
Well, at, at this point in my remark, it's necessary for all of us to sort of shift gears because I want to say a few things about technology's role in architecture in an entirely different sense. We are not talking now about technology in single buildings. We are talking instead about new ways in which metropolitan areas are reorganizing themselves and how architecture fits into that. We see today a new form of suburban commercial and industrial growth spreading across America that's changing the character of the nation in a profound way, which is diluting the cultural, social, and aesthetic values most closely associated with traditional cities. We find high-tech industrial concentrations, office building clusters, hotels, and shopping malls manifesting themselves in, in a sort of a pseudo-city way, what some call megacenters, which are not sent, uh, which are not cities, but which are not suburbs in the usual sense either. They're disconnected from older suburbs as well as traditional big cities. They offer no sense of history or no, no ethnic or racial diversity. They offer only new collections of instant buildings in which to make or spend money. These buildings offer not even a hint of true intellectual purpose. Many have no schools, no churches, no social organizations, no housing. They're built along expressway corridors, near airports, on farmland, and so on. They satisfy companies seeking cheap land and cheap labor, and they appeal to people who were reared in the suburbs and are innocent of urban life. They're multiplying partly because businessmen are finding less need for what they call adjacency. You don't have to face somebody on a one-to-one -one basis. You don't have to have eye contact with them to close a deal or swing a transaction. In the 1980s, you can accomplish that sort of thing quite often with computers and communication satellites. So technology entirely outside the practice of architecture is dictating the way we now build these non-cities or anti-cities, if you will. These places create an illusion of vitality, but this is really just a cosmetic achievement of comprised of shiny architecture and interior design and the endless display of consumer goods. Now the sterility of these places, to my way of thinking, reflects more than anything else the weakness of regional planning agencies and the way that big business has, in effect, taken over governmental planning roles since World War II. To make things worse, Planners, regional planners and city planners, tend to employ single strategies across whole metropolitan areas in all parts of the country. They assume homogenization, and they tend to ignore the nuanced differences between central cities and suburbs. And private enterprise follows similar assumptions to simplify the marketing strategy is understandable, and encourage the dominance of franchise businesses and chain stores. Now, I don't suggest that architects and planners can at this point reverse such a powerful trend. I do suggest that these professions try to take a stronger pro bono role in steering the future course of such growth. Because as an urban creature, I feel uneasy about where these megacenters are carrying us. In any case, we see that both single buildings and multiple buildings in concentration raise profound questions about human values and human opportunities. We're forced to think about our diminishing supply of urban environments that encourage creativity and spontaneity instead of homogeneity and conformity. And in thinking about this, our survey must deal not only with the science of architecture, the technology, but also the art of architecture. 
So we return again this evening to an examination of the changing forms of architecture and how people respond to them very briefly. I think it's apropos here to recall a bit of rather elegant prose written by Norman Naylor some years ago, of which I really fond. Now, it happens that Naylor, in this case, as you'll see in a moment, was actually writing about the beginning of the revolution, the revolution against the international style, against modernism. Still, his observations, if you sort of filter them through the present day context, his observations remain germane today in a little different way. I now quote Norman Mailer writing about modernism. Quote, The essence of this architecture is that it beheads. It beheads individuality, dissent, extreme possibility, and romantic faith. It blinds vision, deadens instinct, and obliterates the past. It makes factories look like college campuses or mental hospitals where once factories had the specific beauty of revealing their huge and sometimes brutal function. It makes the new buildings on college campuses look like factories. This architecture destroys the past. There is no trace of forms which lived in the centuries before us. None of their arrogance, their privilege, their aspiration, their canniness, their creation, their vulgarity, we are left with less and less sense of the lives of men and women who came before us. The giants of the Bauhaus are the true villains. Modern architecture at its best is even more anomalous than at its worst, for it tends to excite the Faustian and empty appetites of the architect's ego rather than reveal an architect's vision of our collective desire for shelter. We hope for shelter which is pleasurable, false closets, secret stair, witch's heart, attic, grandeur, and kitsch, a world of buildings as diverse as the need within the eye. But beware, the ultimate promise of modern architecture is collective sightlessness for the species. End of quotation. Now, modernism began with philosophical and, the and the theoretical underpinnings, of course. But by the 1950s, modernism was increasingly concerned with the question of how to build instead of what to build. It entered the mainstream of architectural practice, and its early proposals were forgotten. At the same time, building systems and codes and construction methods, and this is where technology gets tied back into this interwoven thing, became more complex, and the practice of architecture became more specialized. Big architecture firms adopted the assembly line as a model for their internal organization. Theoretical speculation simply did not fit into this model. Professional practice took theory and stylized it, thereby draining it of cultural content. So theory became a field of specialization with its own jargon and so on. And such architectural scholars as Ellen Dunham Jones have pointed out that contemporary architectural theory today has reached an impasse. We're reluctant to speculate about what architecture should be, so we concentrate on critiquing architecture of the present. Nostalgia and irony get a lot of attention while we permit criticism and style to masquerade as theory. One thing we need are theoretical proposals about what architecture ought to be. And these proposals should address the old questions of who and why we are and try to answer them in terms of our present culture. All of this suggests that architectural education needs a more comprehensive grounding in culture. It's simply the old idea of the integration of more liberal arts in the architectural curriculum. Architects cannot respond to contemporary needs without understanding the nuances of our culture. Understanding such needs is not necessarily an esoteric or excruciatingly difficult enterprise, nor is such understanding in conflict with development of architectural theory that may be a bit more abstract. 
Some basic truths are right under our nose if we'd only learn to be better observers. For example, most architects view suburban single-family tract houses as anachronistic, culturally obsolete. But by just about any, up, any other standards, the single-family tract house is still the most popular form of housing in America. And when, when architects criticize it, I think they're actually condemning the set of social and aesthetic values that it represents. The architects may see themselves out at the cutting edge of cultural change, but that's not the vision of the suburbanite. And I, I make these remarks about housing simply to underscore my point about cultural understanding. People have special reasons for wanting to live in the suburbs and for wanting to live in the city. And you must understand the nuances of such attitudes if you expect to do an intelligent job of planning and design. I don't think that the architecture of our time needs a blazing new ideology behind it. I don't think it needs a new set of dogmas, either social or political. But architects do need to acknowledge that there are values other than their own that deserve consideration. Certainly an architect must offer his own alternatives for solving problems and filling programmatic requirements even if those alternatives do not neatly fit the thinking of the client. Surely the architect's creativity must not be suppressed. And obviously there is no substitute for his technological knowledge. But in the end, architecture must also be respectful of broader concerns, including those that extend beyond the needs of the client. It should be respectful of context. It should not be allowed to mindlessly disrupt the existing fabric of a community. And out of such concerns, I think, there can grow a pluralistic architecture that is richly created. This is an exciting time for architecture, but it's hope that it leads to work that makes the most of technology without allowing it to override humanistic values. Thank you very much. We could do a Q&A, a few questions right now, and then we could have other, other questions in the exhibit area. Do we have any questions right now? Yes. Is Chicago doing anything with solar energy? Uh, practically nothing except for a few uh, low-grade installations for heating. Heating water. That's about it. Uh, southern exposures, of course, in and that sort of thing could be the trick. But basically, residential and not much of that. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Got to understand it before you can understand 
is misuse, abuse, etc. Uh, and it certainly is a, a remarkable tool for the small. I mean, most of you know all this. Shared time for small shops. This isn't just for for HOK and SLM and so forth. And sure, it has it has a well, particularly play a very important role in architecture. It's a matter of letting it run away, uh, leaving it out by the nose. And I think I think that's a legitimate concern. Anyone else? Thank you very much. <laughs>